From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, this is a Headache Soul production. Welcome to Just the Tipsters, America's favorite true crime podcast, and I'm your host, Melissa Morgan. With me today is my beautiful and talented co-host, Joshua Bevan. Say hello, Joshua. Morning. Hi. <laughs> is that your cute little... It sounds like you woke up like right next to someone and they open their eyes Good and you're morning. hovering above them. You're hovering. You're like... <laughs> there's like oh your my face... Gosh. No, Uh-oh. I did. Oh, no. I totally, absolutely did that to my 10 year old this morning. <laughs> like the Blair Witch. Like I full on he did. Just wakes up and there you're standing by I, the bed. No, I knew he was like shuffling and, and then oh. and his eyes were closed and I was going to, I knew he was up, but I was, I was just going in there. And then I, I just stood with the big like Joker grin. <laughs> like just. How was he not traumatized? Oh God! He, Did he, he cry? No, scream. But, but he like jumped. Yeah, he jumped because there's yeah. a grown man hovering above him with a big smile on his face. Yeah, you might want to file that one away to yeah. use it at a different time. Yeah, it was good. So, April Fools! Yeah. Oh my God! It's April first. Oh, God wait. damn it! Well, but we're recording, so it's not going to come out. But uh, oh, all right. Yeah. I was gonna. I was gonna tell you I was pregnant. Oh, um, congratulations! <laughs> oh no, you're the dad. Oh. <laughs> I don't really know how this works yet, but <laughs> okay. I figured it out. I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have to figure out some sort of a monetary like, thing. Yeah. And yeah, we'll, we'll go you to, can have half custody. We'll go to the custody, uh, <laughs> the counselor and get yeah. the, get a schedule up. Okay. Cool. It feels like you've done this before. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it looks like you. Oh. I, saw, I call it an it. I yeah. probably shouldn't be a mom, should I? They, them? No, no it's an it. Okay. It's totally an it. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen... Oh, no. One friend of mine posted, um, I'm straight. And I was like, well, I think you're bi because you say that every five minutes. But then people were like, oh, I see April Fool's. And I was like, is that really that big of a leap? I didn't, I feel like that was a half-ass attempt. Uh, it feels a little a little. I feel like down, posting yeah. like, I'm white. Huh. <laughs> I... I pass. I, p- <laughs> I pass as a whitey. Yeah, it was weird. I don't know. I think she just has a different sense of humor. Mm. All righty. So you know who's sponsoring today's episode? Who's that? Graveline Tours. Hey. Yeah, they're amazing. If love you, you go to Gra- well, I love them more. We're going to fight over who loves mm-hmm. them more. Graveline.rip. Our friends Adam and Blaze are offering a wonderful promo code of Tipster Forty all together, so that you get 40% off of any of the tours that you want to take if you're in the uh, Los Angeles area. And I cannot recommend them enough. And I know Joshua cannot recommend them enough. So much fun. I actually can't wait until we take our next one and then we can review that. Yeah. Yeah. We have to do that. We have to get that on the boat. Let's schedule that because yes. Yeah. I kind of can't wait. I mean, we'll probably have to flip a coin, whether it's um, a star is torn or Manson's murderous oh, right. sprees. Yeah. I kind of want to go to Manson's murderous spree because I want to see this Bond Ranch. Yeah. But hey, hey, Adam, can we take both? You know he would let us do anything. <laughs> yeah, and another uh, abrupt side note is that apparently my Apple products believe that Adam and I are one. Mm. Um, as I had uh, sent to Joshua and Adam, my um, Apple Watch one day last week, last week one evening said, Hey Adam, you can still do it. You can close your exercise rings. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. It didn't dawn on me. It was that Adam. And then I went to order something on my iPhone and it said, send to Adam. Huh? I know. So those two things, you know how they say Apple products sync. Yeah. Those two things are synced, but my MacBook pro still believes that I'm Melissa. Right. So I'm only two thirds Adam or Adam sure. is two thirds me. I don't sure. know. Is it that Adam or is is that the immaculate baby that you uh Oh that carrying? you and I are having? Yeah. Oh yeah, the um the immaculate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what maybe, how it happened. Maybe its name is Adam. Yeah, I'll name I'll name the baby I'm not having that you're the father of, but not really Adam. Yeah. yeah. It, that was his way of letting me know he's coming into the universe. Yeah. 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 He's on my Apple Watch and Apple and iPhone. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing. I am absolutely not an alien, right? Yeah, no, you absolutely are. <laughs> One hundred percent. I told what? Adam we are now one. Yeah, I was have, like, "Hey, look, you're on my you're on my iPhone and my you, Apple Watch. We are one." You have some emails back and forth, and then, and then suddenly he's taken over my 
Uh, yeah, oh, no. my personality. Uh-huh. I know. We've never even met in person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yet he is he and, and I are yeah, one. Yeah, your Fitbit uh yeah, yeah. tracker is. Do on. you know what's how funny Adam is? When he was saying, Can we sponsor the the podcast and what could be the promo code? How about Fitbit? Because I know I told him how my fit I'd blown out three Fitbits. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Isn't that funny? <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Okay. He's got such so, a great sense of humor. Oh, maybe that's why. Because I said Fitbit and my Apple Watch was angry at me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's jealous. I don't want to talk about this <laughs> anymore. Now I'm starting to get I'm starting to get upset because. Well, um, before we get to this case, which we have been wanting to do for a couple of months now, and it was suggested by our beautiful uh, editor, Matthew, I had tried to get uh, the um, lead detective who is retired to discuss this case. And this lets you know what kind of a good man he is. He is still uh, has a close relationship with the family. And he had asked the family if he could be interviewed. And I don't even think he wanted to be because it upsets him still so much. And the family would have been okay with it, but they didn't want to talk about the case because mm. they're still hurting. Yeah. And I completely uh, and utterly understand. Absolutely. So before we get to that one, which we're getting to just a moment, I got a uh, message from a detective who said, hey, did I uh, ever talk to you about Jane Doe number 38 or whatever? And I'm like, no. Mm-hmm. And he goes, okay, I'm going to uh, send you the stuff. And I'm like, all righty. So then because he's hilarious, like a day later, I get a message and he said, I can't find your email address. Give it to me. It's like... um level six security or something, which we have this little funny thing. I always say like the condor flies at night. Yeah. And he always says the chef has a long mustache. That's his. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always say secure sector seven. We just do this weird shit back and forth. But now you put your secret codes out there. Oh, fuck. Now everyone's going to know. Damn it. Yeah. They don't mean anything. But um, so (laughs) he sent me this case. Uh, I believe it's unsolved. She's no longer a Jane Doe. I know her name. But uh, Joshua? It's 27 pages long. Oh, wow. And it's just an overview of the case. Oh, my gosh. So I can't wait to dig into that. This case, again, sent to us by our beloved editor, uh, Matthew. At first, I thought, well, that's really awesome, Matt. It's it's an interesting local case to L.A., and it involves music, which we know Matthew loves so much. Mm -hmm. Um, One of his podcasts that he hosts is called One Hit Thunder. I really enjoy so that fun. one. Yeah, it's I really so enjoy fun. that one. I find a lot of really fascinating information about, you know, bands that may have had one big hit and what they do now, where they've gone with yeah. So I know music is a very big part of his life. You you probably won't believe this, but Matthew and I, two of the whitest people on earth, have had a lot of really deep dive discussions on on old school rap and hip hop. Yeah, that tracks. <laughs> 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 like some ob- obscure <laughs> you know, duos and yeah, yeah, I was, I look, I think I'm a complete weirdo. And then sometimes I'll say something and Matthew will go, Oh, that's one of the things that got me into hip hop. And I'm like, shit, now we have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's always, he's always surprising to me. He's, he's like a fascinating enigma. So when he brought this case up to me, I vaguely remembered it. I was like, wait a minute, I've been here. I've lived here for 31 years. And this happened in, um, late 1999, but the case probably got a lot more press in 2000. And it has a local um, connection hmm. to Santa Clarita. So oh, local, local. Okay. That, oh, yes, sir. That local. So Cesar Rosas mm-hmm. is probably the most recognizable member of Los Lobos. He's mm-hmm. like David Hidalgo is the lead singer who has a beautiful voice, but Cesar has like the very jet black hair, the little salt okay. patch, always wears okay. black Ray-Bans, you know, yeah. like Roy Orbison. And then is also a left-handed guitar player. He's the lead guitarist. Got it. And he just, to me, he's the one, whenever I think of Los Lobos, I think of him. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. even though I don't, he sings backup, but he plays, and I'm not like, you know, uh, instrumental aficionado, but he plays beautifully. And he has this very interesting collection of guitars, like um, vintage guitars, like a mm-hmm. 1952 Gibson and like a a 60s era, like a Gretsch 
uh, it's called like the country gentleman. So it's kind of big. Oh, okay. So it's not like he just plays, you know, bull- bullshit guitars. Sure. He plays really cool guitars, but he's kind of mostly known for his um, Fender guitars, like nine, nine, circa 1960s, like a Stratocaster and mm-hmm. Telecaster. So he's, I mean, he's, he's a really cool dude. So he, Caesar, Cesar, I, I didn't always want to say it correctly. And the lead singer, David Hidalgo, met in high school. And they were in, um, this is like the San Gabriel Valley okay. somewhere. So they met in high school and they, in the 80s, and they kind of bonded over this love of like R&B music. Hmm. And they, you know, Los Lobos is known for how, and I started to say, how would you describe it? But you're too young. You probably don't remember. Kind of rock, kind of alt it's, rock. It's, yeah, okay. Um, occasionally, um, some like, uh, Mexican like tinges. Fusion. Yeah. Fusion's good. That's a yeah. good name. The, the hit, I guess they're most known for is like, will the wolf survive? I think is the big one, really big one, yeah. but they, you know, like won Grammys. I mean, they, yeah. and they've been together yeah. for 40 mm-hmm. some fucking years. Okay. And they, and they, one of the things I loved about, I love about Los Lobos, they're still recording. They're still recording. They have a new album out. I think it was 2022. Oh, okay. These are dudes in their 60s. Nice. And and they're like amazing. And David Hidalgo's voice is still beautiful. And uh, Cesar's guitar playing is still remarkable, especially because he's like a lefty. You know, it's like he's he's a really, he's an amazing dude. And he, he looks very stern, I guess, because of the black soul patch and the black sunglasses. But he's... When you see him without the sunglasses, his whole being lights up. And one of the things that was, you could see the light in him was when he was standing next to his wife, like on the red carpet when he was getting, you know, Grammy awards Mm -hmm. and you could just see them together. You could almost feel like an invisible rope between them. Like they're standing there and he's holding up a, a Grammy with one hand and his arm is around his wife, but it's not like they're even touching except that he has his arm around her, but there's like, there's something so closely bonding them together. It's, it was a really beautiful thing to see. It's beautiful. Yeah. Really beautiful thing to see. So here's this band playing around LA and they were totally worshiped by eighties punk bands. Mm-hmm. And they, so they opened for a lot of punk bands Okay, and you would think they'd get like bottles thrown at them or something. And punk bands took to them, punk audiences took to them like the bands did. Wow. So, I mean, it was sort of amazing their trajectory and how they became, you know, a big, huge band and again, won a lot of awards and were amazing. So Cesar is going to go on stage October 23rd of 1999. Okay. And he is in uh, New Orleans. And just as he's about to go on stage, he gets a phone call from his daughters. And they say, Dad, Mom is missing. Oh, no. Uh, It's 11 p.m. and uh, on the East Coast. Okay. And um, we came home, and the front door is open. Oh, no. And there's broken auto glass in the driveway. Oh, no. And the van is gone, and so is mom. Oh. So he gets on a plane and heads right back home. Mm-hmm. And they, of course, start a uh, a search for her. And this case is even more interesting after Matt suggested it than I could imagine because of a combination of things like a deputy district attorney who would not give up because this became prosecuted as a no body case. Oh, but we, we have her, she was found. She was found. Okay. But after everything was over, huh? Okay. it's, it's a very, I'm just going to also, I don't do this because I figure people who listen to true crime have a pretty strong stomach, but I'm going to give you a trigger warning because what is overheard by her daughters is something no one should ever, oh, no. ever have to experience, ever mm. have to experience. I have great respect for the detectives. I, I can't even believe the number of um, Joshua and I were talking about before we started recording about, you know, parenting and and how it takes a village. Mm-hmm. And it t- I feel like sometimes it takes a village 
just to get through this human existence. Yeah, absolutely. And the village that worked on Sandra Rosas's case is one of the most incredible villages from the deputy district attorney to the uh, detectives to uh, search dogs who mm. twice helped get this case, you know, wrapped up. I mean, mm. it, I'm, it, 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 that a deputy district attorney was able to get a no body case through the courts in one year wow. is remarkable. It's, it's remarkable. So the uh, detectives are look searching for her um, in in the you know Roland Heights area. The the guys all grew up in Roland Heights, okay. and they all kind of stayed around there. Got it. They didn't move away. They all you know hometown boys. Sure. And they're a hometown band, and so they look and look many places, and Sandra's van is found in La Puente, abandoned in La Puente three days later. There's some blood evidence inside and tracking dogs track from the van to a local home where Sandra's half brother is living with a friend. Oh, okay. However, we really knew before those three days that Gabriel Gomez, her half brother was involved because of the terrible thing that happened the night that she went missing. So Sandra at the time was 47. Her half brother is 40. Her daughters, when they come home and their mom is missing, immediately call her cell phone. Mm -hmm. It kept ringing and ringing and going to voicemail. And then at one point, an open line happened. Oh, no. And her daughters hear their uncle and their mother and they hear their uncle say, you can never leave me. I am going to make mad, passionate love to you. Oh, God. I'm going to rape you, and I'm going to strangle you. Oh, no. And then the line goes dead. And they don't find her van for three days, and there is blood in the van, and their uncle is arrested at a friend's home, and their mother is nowhere to be found. Mm. Can you imagine hearing... Oh my God, no. Can you imagine what your mother's last moments of her life would be? <sighs> wow. Yeah. So Gabriel Gomez, her half brother, is like, I don't know what you're talking about. I had nothing to do with this. And one of the heartbreaking things is that Sandra was the glue that held the family together, which I think is just one of the reasons why it's so hard for the family to even talk about it now. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for the lead detective who grew to be friends with the family to talk about it now too. Yeah. I get that. And I respect that. Um, and I'm very sorry that anyone had to go through that pain. And I'm grateful that they're all right, that I talk about the case because this is, this is absolutely terrible. And then, some of the superheroes that work on this case reaffirm your faith in humanity because they pushed and pushed and wouldn't, you know, they got him arrested on a warrant for a pro like a probation violation. And then because of that, they were able to get it where he uh, completely no bail. Okay. So he is arrested. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Arrested right away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Within three days. Within three days. Right, right, right. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. Uh, if I if I do know, I was too messed up. I was too drunk and too high on cocaine to um, to know what you're talking about. I, mm. I don't know. I wasn't there. Sandra loved family so much. She went searching. She was adopted mm-hmm. and went searching for her biological parents and found online this half brother Gabriel Gomez. Okay, he had had some felony convictions. And Sandra, being the person that she is, helps him out, brings him into her home, gets him a job on the Los Lobos road crew, so he gets paid. Wow. After a while, it's clear that he doesn't want to work, that he's more of a liability than anything. Mm -hmm. And Sandra, not like, I'm going to just abandon this person who's an albatross. 
she helps him find an apartment, pays for it, and helps him find another job to get on his feet. Wow. And the DA, who I have such respect for, Donald Clem, this deputy district attorney, shows up in a way that is remarkable. He definitely becomes the cocaine bear. He just will not let Gabriel Gomez okay. have one iota of you did this and you're, you know, you are this and we know you did that. And even with no body, he's so convincing and so fierce. He's just like, I'm not going to let this guy get away with this. And he sure the fuck doesn't. He really doesn't. He's amazing. So his theory and his summation of the, of the trial is Gabriel felt his meal ticket was going away. Okay. That makes more sense than anything else in the world. Gabriel did not uh, testify. And he's like, the whole time he's just like, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. Nope, not at all. Mm -hmm. Cesar testified and it was so difficult for him to be on the stand. He couldn't even show back up at court when uh, Gabriel was sentenced. Wow. He was like, I didn't want to, I don't want to be there. I don't want to hear it. He took away not just my wife and my daughter's mother. He took away a huge part of a community. I mean, oh my gosh. So as he's being sentenced, uh, the interesting thing to me is that the judge, Judge Robert Martinez, his trial begins on October twenty third of two thousand. One year to a the day. Wow. One year to the day that she has gone missing. She's still missing. They begin the case on October 23rd. On October 31st, Halloween, mm -hmm. it takes the jury two hours to convict him. Wow. Two hours with no body. Wow. I mean, I don't even know how to express to anyone listening to this. That's remarkable That's, work. Yeah. To get that done in a year yeah. with no body. I mean, wow. in, in 2000. Sure. It, it was it was remarkable. And even the judge chastises him in such a way that, I mean, it really does take a village. In this case, it, it definitely shone through. The judge said, although you smirk today, that smirk will be gone and reality will set in when you'll be in prison for the rest of your life. Uh -huh. And he gave him a pretty stiff sentence, which I'll get to. The judge said, if there is any decency left in you, one day, perhaps one day, not too far away, you will provide the family with the information. Now, here's another weird layer to this case. Five minutes after this sentence, he is being led out of court and reporters are on the courthouse steps. Mm -hmm. And he gives a, sort of an ersatz interview to two different um, local news stations. And he said, I'll, I'll tell him where she is. Wow. Five minutes after he's pronounced guilty. Wow. The whole time denying it and saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And, yeah. One piece of testimony was very interesting. An LA County Sheriff's deputy who was a jailer said about a week after he was arrested, he was in his cell sobbing hysterically and saying, I don't know why everybody's bugging me. I don't remember where I put her body. Oh my God. Yeah. So he's not, you know, as Mark Humphreys used to say, a Phi Beta Kappa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not so smart, uh -huh. but I don't know how long. It, and I have um, a personal antidote about this case that you'll, I think you'll find interesting. So Sandra's sister, Stella, took, you know, the um, stand and said, all my sister wanted to do was to help Gabriel. And the person she was helping turned out to be the devil. Yeah, wow. Well. Apparently, that's when his defense attorney said he really was affected by that testimony. Really? I'm not finding a whole lot of empathy for this mm -hmm. guy. I'm not not finding a whole lot of empathy at all. So his um, defense attorney said, you know, after, and he's like, I'll tell you where she is. He expressed a tremendous amount of remorse, especially after listening to Sandra's sister. Yeah, okay. He feels really bad, very sad. Sure. So he tells them that Sandra is in a park in Roland Heights. They spend two days with search 
dogs and there is nothing. Mm -hmm. The search dogs say there's nothing. He says here she is and she is not there. Mm -hmm. A day later, he's like, all right, she could be in Santa Clarita. And just, just to mess with them, like. You're smart. The DA said this was his F you to the detectives. Yeah. This was his F you like, oh yeah, she's in this park. They spend two days looking. Ha ha. She's not there. Yeah. With the help again of search dogs, the 29,000 block of sand Canyon. Right. Wow. Okay. So here is what is, um, my, my personal antidote. Joshua will confirm, uh, sand Canyon is an interesting area and it had gone it, it's it, the part that has like a lot of houses they're typically many acres it's a lot of horse property it's right. pretty far apart yeah and then there's a like a short section of sand canyon soledad canyon kind of splits it in half mm -hmm. so the short the short area um, I think it's from Soledad to Sierra Highway, the shorter okay. part. Yeah. There's some apartment buildings, a lot of um, undeveloped land. Yeah. She a was trailer parks in there too. Right. Yeah. And I, that's funny you say that. That's one of the um, things that I haven't, I didn't see that. Oh, the trailer parks are down at the other end near Sierra Highway. She was closer to Soledad. Okay. But the things that he mentioned uh, as landmarks, or there. Okay. It's, it's, that's fascinating. You said that. So it was largely undeveloped and he had, I guess, in a drunken rage, you know, raped her, murdered her, brought her in her own van to Santa Clarita, put her in, you know, and this is 23 years ago. So it was even, mm -hmm. you know, less developed, Sure. but I'll tell you when I saw crime scene photos of where she was found, I drove up there a month ago and it looks largely the same, okay. except 23 years later, they're um, leveling it off to develop it. Oh, okay. But she was very close to, to the road in a very shallow grave for a hmm. year. Oh, man. She was found in November of 2000 when he led them to the area. And he said there's an, there's an apartment complex, an online convenience store, mm -hmm. a restaurant, and a trailer park. And a house with oh. red trim. Yeah. Okay. And they I know found exactly it. what you're talking about. They found too. it. No. Here's the very awful, awful part. Not that every part of this isn't terrible. Her family shows up as they're searching, and it was a very shallow grave, just really right off the side of the road. And there was like um, that kind of construction fencing, that like green, like barrier construction fencing mm -hmm. back then. And then I show up. A month ago, and it's there it's now. There well, again, I'm sure different fencing, but because yeah. they're leveling it off to develop it, mm. so she may she may not have been found until now. But it wouldn't have been hard because when you saw where she was, so close to the road, mm -hmm. I would have hoped she would have been found before now if he hadn't told where she was. Oh, sure. But here's just this just. This is terrible. Her family, including her sister, her brother-in-law, and her daughters are at the scene as they're looking on a Tuesday afternoon. Oh, wow. Okay. And one of her daughters identifies her hair clip and her nail polish and an earring. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, wow. Your mom has been buried for a year. Gosh. And there's a hair clip attached to some hair. Oh, no. And some nail polish and an earring. Wow. I can't, These I can't girls. even imagine. Yeah. I can't imagine. They're, they're, they're teenagers? And no, they were like 20s. late. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Like early, or early 20s, young, but still. Young. young yeah, girl. young adults. Yeah. yeah. Very young adults. Oh, man. I, I, I don't even. This district attorney was so. I just love him, how forceful and powerful he is. You know, Gabriel Gomez, his attorney says, you know, it's his final act of contrition to tell authorities that, you know, she's in a shallow grave, you know, 
in the 29,000 block of Sand Canyon. Mm-hmm. And the district attorney is like, well, if this isn't Sandra, he's led us to another woman he's murdered. Mm, uh, but I guess we'll find out soon. So dental records had to identify her. Oh, man. And I'm guessing because he broke the glass in, in her van to kidnap her, um, his blood and her blood were in that van and that's how they oh, okay. a- attached okay. him to to what happened. I mean, in the district attorney, while not having all the details, it was basically confirmed his theory of what happened. Gabriel Gomez was, was like, yeah, that's pretty much it. He strangled her in the van, uh, raped her, and then drove her to Santa Clarita and dumped her body as he's drunk and high on cocaine by the light of the full moon. Oh my gosh. I mean, I don't even, I don't, I don't even know what to say. So Gabriel Gomez had waived attorney client privileges to say, here's where she is. The deputy district attorney said he gave investigators several landmarks. He told them her body was near an all night market, a restaurant, a trailer park, an apartment building and a house with red trim. Mm. Yeah. Thanks so much, Gabriel. Super cool. Um, A lot of the information, I did want to say a lot of the information I got is from a couple of LA Times articles that were so well done. And the reporter's name is Solomon Moore. He did did a remarkable job. So some of the information that I thought was, you know, like pretty interesting is that, you know, um, the police basically figured out it was him three days after, you know, I mean, obviously they had his voice, but I mean, sure. Maybe it was someone else. Although the, her daughters said it was his voice and and our mom's voice in distress, which is like, you know, I love that the DA figured out a way to charge him with first degree murder, but with special circumstances because he kidnapped her. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought that was like, you know, remarkable. Right. And if he was found guilty um, because it was in the commission of a felony, such as kidnapping with special circumstances, he would be eligible for the death penalty, you know, and he pled not guilty, but you know, we know what, we know what happened and oh God, I can't even believe that here she is, this beautiful, wonderful woman married to her high school sweetheart yeah. and trying to find her family, her parents her biological parents and finds a half brother takes him under her wing. Oh man. It just, those things are, yeah, those things made me want to like throw up a little bit. This is one of those beautiful things that, that district attorney Clem said, he's like, look, um, I don't care that her body hasn't been found. The fact that this murderer successfully disposed of her body does not entitle him to an acquittal. Yeah. Wow. I know. Well, that's, that's, that's real. That's, I know. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever been as in awe of a district attorney as I am him. Can't I am done. like, yeah. he's just, he's pretty amazing. So outside of the courtroom before Gabriel Gomez says where she is. Cesar tells reporters, you know, he didn't just hurt me. He hurt hundreds of people who loved Sandra. And that I, I believe with all my heart. I mean, I don't, yeah. it, it's, you know, Mark used to call it the ripple effect. When you do something terrible like that, it isn't just that you've gotten revenge or whatever your right. reasoning is for ending someone's life. It's not just that you've done so much more to so many more people mm-hmm. than you'll probably ever. Absolutely. And I respect the detective who thought about talking to me, but couldn't because he got teary eyed. Yeah. I respect the fact that he 23 years later doesn't, it, it doesn't is. want to talk about this case. Yeah. I respect the fact that he asked the family and they didn't want to talk about it, but they would let, him talk about it, but then they all end up crying. Yeah. I would never want to reopen something for a family, but I feel like this case is so interesting. And I, you know, lived here at the time and I remember her going missing and I didn't remember any of the other information that happened. And it, 
to me, it needs to be a story that's told because it is a story of hope and reaffirms my faith in humanity because that village came together and kicked Gabriel Gomez's ass. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's after the fact and nobody gets real, you know, there's no such thing as closure. Mm -mm. And in this case, there's probably no such thing as a small modicum of peace. The only peace that Cesar Rosas said he got is that he knew Gabriel wouldn't be on the street hurting anyone else again. You know, it's too late for his wife, the love of his life, but he won't be doing it again. And he, you know, had prior felonies. So God knows what he would have done. Yeah. It just, I thought the story was so fascinating. And I, because I didn't know what happened and because I see Los Lobos all the time, I had no idea what he was going through Yeah, and still writing and and performing. still going. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I would be able to do that. They recorded an album in 2022 and they have a video for one of the songs, I think it's it's something like hometown hometown boy or something, mm-hmm. something about the city of LA, and they're on like um kind of an elevated mesa where you can see like a lot of downtown. Okay, it's I don't know where it is, but it's and they have obviously the video is shot with I don't know a drone maybe or something because they're all kind of spaced out on this big you know mesa and everybody looks a little different. 40 years later, you know, sure. David Hidalgo's hair is gray and he's, you know, a little bigger and Cesar is playing his guitar exceptionally. Mm. I mean, just, he does something to a guitar that's sort of magical. I guess a lot of musicians and, and musical um, publications tried to talk to him about how he does what he does and he tries to explain it, but I think it's just one of those things. He's like an open channel. Just, yeah. 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 Like he never took, you know, guitar lessons, okay. you know, he and the other guys in the band met in high school and they bonded over this love of R&B and they would listen to old, like Sam Cooke records cool, and pick up, you know, whatever crappy guitars they could find or buy with, you know, their little bit of money. And right. then I think some people are just born to do what they do. That's amazing. And he's one of those people. And I'm, I'm glad that he still does it and he does it beautifully. And I am so sorry that he and his family ever had to go through something like this. But it also makes me happy to know it gave me a lot of faith in the LA County, you know, detectives from the sheriff's department, the district attorney, yeah, well. even, even, you know, scent dogs, which I tend to say are about 50, 50. Sure. The, the scent dogs were like in the first scene, they were like, she's not here. Hmm. She's not here. And they kept doubting them and stayed. Yeah the scent dogs in San Canyon were like, she's right here. Yeah. They found her. Yeah. Wow. I know it, it, the terribleness, it's such a, it's like a um, seesaw of terribleness and, and yet some good. I'm trying to see the the good. Sure. It's so hard to see the good. Thank you, tipster Matt for uh, being an amazing human being for editing um, this beautiful dumpster fire that we try to do every <laughs> week and for telling us about this case. Cause I think it was, such a really interesting case, heartbreaking in so many ways, but yet life yeah. affirming in others. Yeah. So if you have a tip on a missing person or unsolved homicide that you would like us to cover, or you just want to suggest a case of any kind, give us a call at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. You can email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. You can find us on any of the social media platforms, just the tipsters Facebook page, J- JT Tipsters on Instagram, JT Tipsters Pod on Twitter, and more cowbell. If you would like to support this podcast and get early access and other cool murderous swag, go to patreon.com slash just the tipsters. Mm-hmm.